Hi there. Welcome back. And we're so glad that you've tuned in because we are now beginning Advent. Can you believe we are already in December of 2023? Time stops for no one, doesn't it? Well, today we want to begin with our Advent reading of hope. And as we're talking about the Grinch, we're using excerpts from the movie, the book, um, throughout the month. So our reading for our Advent lighting today actually begins with a portion from that. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why, nobody knows the reason. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. It could be that his head wasn't screwed on just right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve, hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm lighted windows below in their town. Now this story follows our green Grinch, anti-Santa, as he hatches a plan to steal Christmas from the Who's. Now he's not trying to steal the day, mind you, but all of the trappings, all of the things that he believes define the day. He slips into their homes while they're sleeping, and he begins filling large sacks with all of their Who Christmas decorations and food and presents. And he stuffs them one by one up the chimney, loading them into a sleigh that is to be pulled by his poor little dog, Max. Now today begins our season of Advent the time we spend preparing our hearts for the birth of Christ. And week one is traditionally the week of hope. It is the Grinch's hope that he will disrupt the people of Whoville's Christmas plans by taking everything away that means Christmas for them. Will it work? What happens when everything we have planned for Christmas goes wrong? Where is our hope then? Isaiah writes for us in chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. What are you hoping for this Christmas? What are you hoping it will be for you and your family? Are you expecting to pull out all of the trappings to create the spirit of Christmas in your heart? Or will you cling to the hope that comes from the gift of the Messiah on Christmas morning? Now I wanna to start today by showing you a video, a very short video from TikTok that somebody posted about a meal they purchased, as you can see from McDonald's. Take a listen. McDonald's, so I get there's a labor shortage, I get there's wage increases and a number of other things, but $16, $16 for a burger, a large fry and a drink. It's, it's just crazy. Now, I could zoom in and see on the receipt, which you might not be able to see, that he um, has a receipt dated from December of 2022. So it was a year ago. And he lives in Idaho. So it's not like New York or Chicago or L.A. McDonald's capitalizing on their location. It's Idaho, where potatoes are grown. So a burger in Idaho and fries and a large Coke cost $16.10 at McDonald's. And this man is disappointed. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, dude, you went to McDonald's. What did you expect? And that's a fair question. What was he expecting by going to McDonald's for dinner? Now, I'm not bashing McDonald's because they have their place, their niche in the market, right? This man was expecting subpar food at a subpar cost. And he thought that would be a fair exchange. But what he got was subpar food at above par cost for what he thought about the location. And this is where the rub comes in. This is where the disappointment is realized. Disappointment, the result of unmet expectations, the letdown, the regret, the disenchantment, 
all stealing the adequacy, adequacy of an average fast food meal. Now, the cost of the meal did not make him happy. It wasn't a happy meal for him. It wasn't what he expected when he chose McDonald's. But he chose it. It was his decision to make, and he made it. But then he was disappointed in how it turned out. Now, the Grinch hates Christmas, but we don't know why. He chooses to, and it's his decision to make. Perhaps he hates Christmas because he has been disappointed too many times in the past, and he's guarding his heart. Perhaps the disappointment has caused his heart to be the thing that shrinks two sizes too small. So as we begin our Advent, we also begin the buildup, the preparation, and all of the hype for the most wonderful time of year. What is it about Christmas that makes it complete for you and yours? And what expectations do you have that determine whether or not your Christmas is going to be merry? And what will happen if your expectations are not met? Especially around something as important as Christmas. Are we doing something wrong that causes us to feel disappointment instead of peace? Now we're turning to both the Old Testament and the New Testament today for our teaching on setting expectations for Christmas. We begin in Micah 5 with the very famous prophecy of the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. Hear these words from Micah 5, 2, 4, and 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are a small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then in his greatness he will reach out to them to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Now, why do we read this prophecy today? Because it's the prophecy of Jesus' birth? And yes, that is part of it. But it's also because this prophecy was not necessarily good news to everybody who heard it. It disappointed some in a couple of ways. First, it was certainly not what the religious elite wanted, that the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem. Now, Micah was a prophet who ministered to Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel that was created after the two kingdoms split in half. And Micah had accurately predicted that the Assyrians were going to invade the north and overtake them. Now, the success of that prophecy gave him easy access to the court and kings around him. But Micah preferred to mainly minister to the ordinary people instead. He was a prophet to the poor and the friend to the oppressed. And Micah's prediction of a ruler coming out of obscurity and not out of a powerful family caused quite a stir. This isn't what people expected at all. Typically, heroes were from royal lineage, right? Yet Micah says the Messiah is going to come from this obscure little town of Bethlehem. And he will not serve himself as a king. He will serve Yahweh, and God will provide him with the strength he needs, and he will be a redeemer that will shepherd God's flock with honor. Now, this is a stark contrast to the previous rulers that they've had so far, who have failed to do what God has asked over and over. And so Micah's prophecy says that his ministry is going to bring in the end peace, not suffering, not angst. But he also doesn't promise battle victory or victory of conquering of other nations. He promises peace. Peace. Now think about that for a second. Who would find this good news and who would be disappointed? If you were one of the poor peasants that Micah ministered to, this would be good news. The Savior was going to be one of them. Not one up there born on the holy hill in the capital or in a high place. The most insignificant little town that they knew of is going to bring forth the most significant person to ever live. So this can only mean wonderful things for the people who are from there as well. Now, if you were a king or a ruler or a religious leader, even, you'd be worried about this news, even disappointed. 
because they were hoping for a conqueror that would liberate them and make them great once again. Not a shepherd that would bring peace. There's no money in peace, not even in our world today. And so this news was disappointing to those who had a stake in the current system. But eventually, it became even disappointing to the poor who were holding out hope for this Messiah. Because things don't happen very quickly in God's timing. They happen when he says they'll happen. Now, these folks are used to waiting. That was nothing new to them and a part of their culture that things just did not happen quickly back then. It was the nature of life. But it was disappointing to them how long they were having to wait because they waited and they waited and they waited. Now, fast forward 700 years, but you have to fast forward like VCR style, not skip style, because remember, time moved slow back then. We've already established that. But it isn't until 700 years later that the birth of Jesus finally is fulfilled. 700 years. That's seven centuries, 70 decades. That's give or take 36,500 weeks. You get that it's a long time to wait. But it happens. The promise is fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. But those who were given the promise on that day didn't get to see it realized. Now, when you've waited so long for something to happen, you know what sometimes happens? You have a hard time believing that it's true. And that's exactly what took place. And Matthew records what happened was Jesus was born. And it reflects back to this very prophecy from Micah. We find it in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 8. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When the King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet Micah has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. So we remember this, right? So Herod called the Magi secretly, found it out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them on to Bethlehem and said, go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. So the news of the birth of the long-awaited Messiah ruffles the feathers of King Herod. Why? What difference does it make to the government if a baby is born out in the boondocks? Well, Herod knows. He knows that these people have been waiting and waiting for their Redeemer. These Jews are tired of being under Roman authority and fed up with the circumstances of their lives, and they want better. Micah said that when the Messiah was born, it would get better for the people, not the kings. Now, Herod also knows about the book of Daniel and the prophecies that Daniel made about the coming Messiah. And anybody who knows how to count knows that the days of that prophecy are up too. So Herod calls on the people who may be able to provide some answers and insight, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. And he asks them exactly what does this prophecy say about the birth of Messiah? And as all of the pieces seem to be falling into place, Herod panics. He calls the Magi to verify the event. He needs to know if this is actually really finally happening. Now, King Herod is actually the Grinch of his time. He hates Christmas, and he isn't even sure why. On the one hand, he's sitting pretty as king of an oppressed people. He looks down on them from above, judging them and their circumstances and their lifestyle, just like the Grinch does in the story about how the Grinch stole Christmas. 
Just as the Grinch doesn't understand the Who's who live down in Whoville, neither does Herod understand the Jews. But Herod's not about to take a chance and underestimate the power of their God. See, with just the right news, these people, they could come together and rise above their circumstances. And so like the Grinch, he puts a plan into motion to steal what makes Christmas Christmas. The Grinch and Herod think they know how to put a stop to Christmas. They'll take away what it is to the people that makes Christmas happen. And then it won't come. For each of these two, if they remove the reason for us to be joyful, then they can remove the joy. Now, if I asked you right now to picture someone in your life who has a heart that might be two sizes too small, could you think of someone? When you think about the Grinch, is there somebody that automatically just comes to your mind? Maybe it's somebody that you just had dinner with around the Thanksgiving table. But we all know somebody who just never seems happy with anything. And we don't have to think too hard before we can add a face to that grinchy, grinchy ideal in our minds. But did you ever stop to think and wonder why somebody may hate Christmas? What possible reason could someone have for hating lights, carols, and good cheer? Now, we're never told why the Grinch hates Christmas. See, but that this thing is the thing about hate. Hate doesn't need a reason, or a valid one anyways. Sometimes we act like the Grinch because the world is just not going our way. I, too, had a run-in with McDonald's recently that left me feeling oh so disappointed. They have that two-line system where you can pull into either lane for ordering. I chose the outer lane one evening, and I watched car after car go through the other line as I sat there. Three times the man on the interphone on the speaker said, I'll be right with you. But the third time I yelled back at him, no, you won't. <laughs> You're waiting on everybody in the other line. All I wanted was something to quiet the rumbling in my stomach I had not eaten all day. I didn't want to put in a whole lot of effort. I didn't even care if it tasted very good, obviously. I, like the TikToker earlier, wanted quick, fast, and cheap. But what happened is it took me 25 minutes to get a hamburger. I was so angry by the time I got to the window that I admit I did ask for the manager. And I suggested that perhaps he could do some fur further training for this young man who was struggling to understand the system. And I'll admit as well that I didn't eat the hamburger because I was worried that after my yelling through the intercom that they perhaps had tampered with it. My heart had shrunk at least two sizes sitting in that drive through Every prayer I said, every trick I tried could not bring down my increasing anger. And as I drove away, I was disappointed. I was disappointed in them. I was disappointed in me. What do we do when our expectations are not met? As far as humanity goes, we react rather poorly. We always have. The Bible details the Israelites expressing their disappointment after disappointment with a God who did nothing but take care of them. The Bible also details the new believers in Jesus Christ expressing disappointment in how he was doing his ministry. And to this very day, we are disappointed in all of the ways that God has not fulfilled our expectations, even while what he has done has gone unappreciated. The Grinch chose to steal everyone's Christmas to take away what gives them hope and purpose. The world is after your Christmas as well. They're hoping to steal your Christmas spirit. So what is it exactly that makes your Christmas merry? And just what exactly could undo all of that? The spirit of Christmas lives in our heart. That is where hope and peace and joy and love are found. So as you sit up on this hill of Advent, looking down at the prospect of all of Christmas that lays before you, how will you set the expectations for a Merry Christmas? We begin today by remembering what Christmas is really about. And it's about the gift of Jesus. 
It is when we begin to place our worship on the trappings of Christmas that we get lost and forget that. So as long as our expectation is to celebrate the joyous gift of the birth of Jesus, then we can't be disappointed. So set yourself up for a wonderful Christmas season by setting the right expectations. If we hold the birth of Christ in our heart, we begin Advent with a magical peace. And finding peace begins with the hope that we hold right inside there in our hearts. Would you pray with me? Gracious and glorious God, we thank you for this season of Advent. We thank you for the abundance of love and goodness that you have rained down on us. And we apologize, Lord, for the times that we are not thankful. Because there are many times that we become disappointed and disenchanted, even with the goodness that you give us. As we prepare ourselves for this season of Christmas, help us to not set ourselves up for failure and disappointment. But instead, Lord, prepare our hearts to truly honor the reason that we are celebrating, the gift of this miracle that you gave us, and without cost to us, but all to you. And so we give you thanks, and we pray, Lord, that you will guard our hearts and fill them with hope this Advent. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in, and I hope we get off to a good start with Advent this week.